Good morning students. So, we are going to go ahead with the module 4, our lecture 5 in the previous lectures. What we have studied is, we have studied the reactors in general, the catalyst media. Then we have also seen the exothermic reactions. So, like in the previous lecture, we have seen the exothermicity of the reaction, how it is controlled in the case of styrene manufacture. So, moving ahead with that, we now go on and actually discuss the production of ethene oxide. The ethene oxide and as well as the anhydride, we will see the example of a malic anhydride preparation. So, we are seeing the selective oxidation process continuing with that as previously discussed, these are highly exothermic reactions. So, one of them is the production of ethene oxide, we will discuss the production of ethene oxide, the reaction and kinetics and then we will also discuss the flow sheet, the industrial flow sheet for it. So, there are two ways we will discuss the, we will see which method is particle suitable, which is more optimum in terms of economics. While the other uh, short, we will discuss shortly even with the malic anhydride process. The malic anhydride is similar to ethene oxide, only it is that, that there is some new invention, there is some process innovation where uh, a catalyst has been designed and the catalyst has been designed to be operated in a riser cum reactor. So, we will see that, that has been developed recently. So, we are DuPont. So, we will see that also and discuss in the later stages of our lecture. So, uh, we have seen in the previous lecture also, this lecture also, we will see that uh, the solid catalyst based selective oxidation techniques, we have studied this in uh, detail. So, we, uh, this can be used for the manufacture of formaldehyde. In this case, we are discussing ethene oxide, malic anhydride and thallic anhydride. Okay. So, selective oxidation means I need to get a particular product. So, oxidation means there may be many product, we want to do selectively a single product, so that we do not want the undesired product, we do not want more of byproduct. So, it is that why these processes are coupled as selective oxidation processes. So, these are technologically difficult, the reason is due to the high exothermicity, because you know because of high exothermicity, your rate of the reaction decreases. Uh, so, you need to do something like you need to quench or you need to remove the heat or you may need to insert the feed and intermediate stages. These are several approaches where you bring down the heat of reaction. So, like we discussed in the previous lecture, the catalyst bed and the inert media, the inert for the styrene may be used to capture heat. Like that, this will be a complex process, technological difficult class of processes, each having their own reactions or the byproducts. So, the kinetic scheme is complex because uh, you know if you add oxygen for example, you do a combustion, it is not like we want to do a combustion of a single product, the raw material, maybe there are some intermediate form, it may go complete or partial combustion to give some other product which may be polluted. So, these are very cause of concern because it is significant volume of byproducts. So, we are need to design in such a manner of reaction scheme, we apply a chemical engineering concepts in such a manner. So, you get the desired product to be more in volume as compared to the undesired products. So, this particular uh, lecture will uh, actually formulate some processes based on the manufacture of ethene oxide and malic anhydride. So, both these compounds are important because these are the precursors for the preparation of polymers, plasticizers, resins. So, that is why this is very important. Epoxidation process is unique to ethene. So, ethene oxide means it is a epoxy ring is there. So, this epoxidation is unique, what you do have you have CH2, CH2 connected with respect to oxygen in a epoxy ring. Okay. So, this epoxy ring uh, what you do is if you make this ethene oxide, so you can easily form polymers from this ethene oxide because epoxy, epoxy ring are very much reactive. So, silver is the only metal which is capable of catalyzing in this process, that is you want to convert ethane starting material or ethene. So, in this case we are talking about ethane, ethane to uh, those ethene oxide uh, only silver is capable of catalyzing it. But similar reactions for the selective oxidation of propene and butene have not yet yielded a catalyst. So, even though with ethane you can convert it to this ethene oxide, but similar catalyst have not been developed for other alkanes for example, for propene or butene which has not yielded a catalyst. So, even ethane or ethene either way we have to use the silver based catalyst, but no such catalyst exists for propene and butene till now. So, it means that the synthesis of malic anhydride again 
we are talking about ethane oxide. The synthesis of this malic anhydride is intriguing because it is perspective because I will later on discuss the malic anhydride will take on the perspective of both as a catalyst and as well as a reactor. So, it will include the principles of chemistry as well as principles of chemical engineering in the terms of reactor technology. So, let us focus on ethene oxide. The ethene oxide is a raw material for intermediates and consumer products. The 60 percent of its use is used for the production of ethene glycol, okay, ethene glycol is ethylene glycol. It accounts for about 60 percent of its use. It can also be used for the production of surfactants and ethanol amines. So, after polyethylene, polyethene, ethene oxide is the second largest consumer of ethene. So, ethene is fine, ethene is used for making polyethene, but with ethene, the second largest consumer as a raw material is used for making this ethene oxide. So, how does this made? It is usually made by the cyclohydrin process, cyclohydrin I will tell you what is that. So, here what it does is it has a chlorine gas, this is the old process, you know these three reactions, these are the old process, the way it was manufactured earlier, old process means. So, there is no single route that to convert directly ethene to ethene oxide. So, it is a collection of three steps, so, what is that? Chlorine is first reacted with water to form hypochlorite solution plus HCl. This hypochlorite solution is reacted with ethene, this is ethene, two molecules of ethene, this is ethene. It reacts with two molecules of ethene to form cyclohydrine, cyclohydrine. Okay. Then this cyclohydrine is again reacted with uh, calcium hydroxide, the lime solution to form this ethene oxide okay, plus calcium chloride and water. So, the if you see all these reactions later to are exothermic in nature, the initial first one is endothermic. The problem is okay, we are starting with chlorine, we are starting with water, but at the end we use lime. So, lime then gives calcium chloride. So, a lot of this chlorine is lost, I mean calcium chloride does not have any use, so it is just lost as a byproduct. So, a lot of and moreover with this reactions which are highly exothermic particularly the second one, it may also degrade and form the pollutant gases like carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide because it has carbon in it. So, in this case that is also another problem. So, this method is not much useful, but this method is still useful when you take the precursor as propene or butene because there is no such catalyst to convert propene to propene oxide or butene to butene oxide. So, this route through cyclohydrine is still used for propene oxide, manufacture of propene oxide or butene oxide. So, just I will go back, that is you may just correct it, this is chlorohydrine, chlorohydrine, C H L O R O chlorohydrine process. So, whenever I discuss about chlorohydrine process, I will always relate to the old process the chlorohydrin process and chlorohydrin process again I will just recapitulate chlorohydrin process is still used for the propene to convert propene and butene because of catalysts are not developed for this. So, it is still useful for propene or butene plants. So, chlorohydrin method I told you it results in the acceptable yields of ethene oxide, the yield of ethene oxide is pretty high, but the majority of chlorine is now converted to ineffective calcium chloride and undesirable chlorine containing byproducts. So, as I told you that is ineffective calcium chloride means you do not know this calcium chloride is not much useful. So, this is just wasted. So, that is what there are some improvements made in the process. So, it is an inefficient process and generates significant pollution issues. This process was replaced by the direct oxidation of ethene with either oxygen of air. So, what is the improvement? So, it is not good. What is the improvement? You make a direct oxidation, attempt a direct oxidation of ethene to ethene oxide. But still as I told you plants employ this chlorohydrin pathway to produce propene oxide from propene. Failure, why? Because the failure due to achieve direct oxidation of propene to propene oxide. 
So, we do not have a catalyst to convert propane to propane oxide that is why you still go with the chlorohydrin pathway. Propane oxide plants are converted to ethene oxide plants based on chlorohydrin. So, maybe if the economics say that you have to produce more of ethene oxide. So, this propane oxide plant can be immediately converted to ethene oxide not much change in the reactor or the process uh, flow sheet needs to be made similar process just the raw material changes. So, this is now the conventional method the direct oxidation the overall reaction is this the overall reaction the ethene molecule is reacted with half of O2 to get ethene oxide. So, overall the reaction is exothermic byproducts are also formed because these byproducts are very sensitive to temperature it may form carbon dioxide and water due to the incomplete or complete combustion of ethene. So, it means that uh, this compound if then reacted with oxygen to form carbon dioxide plus water and again or it may also form in this manner incomplete or complete combustion to form these compounds carbon dioxide and water. So, in both cases you have this carbon dioxide and water because all the reaction are highly exothermic and thermodynamically complete. So, the chances of these two reactions are pretty high. So, it means that the act why because the even though the good thing is the good thing about these two uh, the second the last two of this reaction is the activation energies of these unwanted reactions are greater than those of the desired process. So, activation energy is greater so this reactant is less possible, but the temperature is rising because of this delta H is minus 105 even though it is very less still you may reach these two reactions the second and third reaction this is the first reaction second and this is the third reaction the second and third reaction will be possible because of the rising temperature. So, small changes in temperature have significant impact on the selectivity. So, the selectivity of the reaction to produce only ethane oxide will depend upon how good your temperature is controlled. So, it necessitates excellent temperature management. So, you need to maintain the temperature in such a manner the selective nature is followed that is only the first reaction is executed. How do we do that let us see. So, now what they do in the particular process is they have found out a rate of equation for production of ethene oxide they have correlated it with the Langmuir mir hinshel wood equation. So, this is that expression which just now I discussed the first reaction the ethene with oxygen reacts and the use of silver catalyst as a promoter to get ethene oxide. So, this is a reaction what they have found out. So, this is the rate of formation of ethene oxide in moles per gram per hour then you have the reaction rate coefficients of the direct oxidation this uh, so this is the reaction rate coefficients it is in moles per gram per hour then Ke capital Ke and Ko are the adsorption coefficients of this much and this much for ethene and oxygen respectively while the partial pressure is P e and P naught which is the for ethene and oxygen in the reactor. So, this is the kinetics of the process. So, this kinetics this has been approved they are found out through experiments and it is uh, reported in this book this is also the textbook. So, this is the expression. So, this expression once an engineer have it now you can play with the reactor design. So, that is one idea this is you have to find out the reaction what is the rate of formation of EO that is the ethene oxide how can I uh, you know how can I improve or increase the numerator you have to think in that direction and or how can I lower the denominator so, you can think in direction lower denominator means you have to lower the partial pressure lower the partial pressure means what will you do how do you lower the partial pressure because this is in the denominator. So, if you want to lower this term it partial pressure because this Ke K0 is not much dependent on the temperature and pressure, but this partial pressure is dependent. So, if you have for example, if you use diluent or inert so it is further decreasing P e and P o will go down P e and P o will go down. So, if it goes down the numerator will become as constant if we assume that the numerator is constant, but the effect is more felt in this denominator because it is in the square term. So, your uh, rate of the overall reaction will be higher ok so that is why you have to think. So, that is what they are doing in industry they use this inert or diluent they add it in the system. The reason is twofold one is to increase the rate of reaction another reaction which I will just tell now tell you in subsequent uh, slides that is to keep the mixture below the flammability limit upper flammability limit. So, the because if it is more oxygen is supplied what will happen explosion may occur the reactor will just then will be some accident. 
So to keep the mixture in the flammability limit, below the flammability limit, then also you have to use inert. So inert or diluent serves two purpose. One is increase the rate of reaction and also to lower the upper flammability limit. So as I told you, for the production of this ethene oxide, these are the key points. First is the efficient temperature and selectivity control. So as I told you, the temperature needs to be controlled very well because the if you do not control the temperature, the second and third reaction which is the combustion of ethene oxide to carbon dioxide and water will generate and you will have problems in disposing those pollutant carbon dioxide you cannot just throw it in the atmosphere. Then uh, what you will do, you will need uh, you know you need to absorb it or to treat it then so it will increase the and then the re again regenerate it. So it will increase your investment cost. So our aim is a prevention of successive oxidation of ethene oxide. So in order to prevent the further equation 2 and 3, you limit the ethene conversion in each pass between 7 to 5 percent. So do not let ethene to react with oxygen, the conversion you limit it to 7 to 5 percent. So it has been seen if you do that, then the second and third reaction that is the combustion, the production of carbon dioxide with ethene oxide does not happen, it is first reactor. Now as I told you what are the different approaches to remove heat, one is you use inert bed, another is you use quench reactors, another is you insert the feed in different location along the reactor. Then another reaction may be due to I told you is a multi-tubular reactor. In multi-tubular reactor what you do, send the hydrocarbon fluid, what it will do, it will take away the heat from the gaseous mixture. So you send it through the tubes, it will go through the tubes and it will take away the heat from the mixture, the gaseous mixture. So the current plant capacity is around 3 lakh tons per annum, it necessitates reactor with large diameter because you know you need to also see you need a large diameter because you have to produce this much amount of ethene oxide. So what do we do, what is the solution, let us see. So solution is how to minimize the radial temperature gradient because if that, because you may use a fixed bed reactor, pressure drop will be less. But in a fluidized bed reactor, pressure drop will be more. But in the fluidized bed reactor, what happens is there is an attrition of catalyst. There is a catalyst or attrition, there will be selectivity is lost. There was another problem, while in a fixed bed reactor, the selectivity is not there. So what you do is, in a all this, why are we doing? We have to just minimize this temperature gradient. There is a possibility of hot spot. If there is a possibility of hot spot within the reactor, so what you do is, in order to prevent this, you use a multi-tubular reactor, you pass a hydrocarbon liquid through it, but you use a small diameter, small diameter tubes. The design is made in such a manner that as the reactors have several thousand parallel tubes, 6 to 12 meter in length. So the height of the reactor is almost, let us say 6 to 12 meters and 20 to 50 millimeter in diameter. So the diameter is 20 to 50 millimeter. The reaction generated heat is dissipated by a high boiling hydrocarbon or water that circulates around the reactor tubes. Okay. So the, this high boiling uh, uh, hydrocarbon and water will take away the heat outside and it will maintain the reactions that is it will maintain the first reaction the combustion of ethene to ethene oxide. So it means the procedure here involves the reactor cooled by hydrocarbons, coolant vapors are condensed in and then I mean the, if the hydrocarbons take away this heat then it is again condensed and then it is released, the heat is released to an external boiler for waste heat recovery. So this heat can be used elsewhere because you are removing heat and use it everywhere, so it is a heat integration. So going ahead, so what is the solution? Uh, do we use a fluidized bed reactor? If the fluidized bed reactor is equipped with an internal heat transfer space. So it will provide superior temperature control than a multi-tubular reactor. So if not multi-tubular reactor, what are the other options we have? Fluidized bed. But the selection of fluidized bed technique necessitates the use of a attrition resistant catalyst. That is what exactly I was meaning. You may be having a pressure drop is also there and the catalyst also has problem. There is the attrition of the catalyst. So that is why we, what we do, we add inert diluent to the reactor feed. The temperature increase caused by exothermic reactions can be further regulated. So it will take away the heat. So issue is what do we use? Do we use air or do we use oxygen? Because oxygen production is very difficult. When you separate oxygen, you have to separate it out and then use it. 
So, it is another process cryogenic separation is required because you have to separate nitrogen. Why not use air directly because air will also have nitrogen in it. Why not use that? But there is some problem. What is the problem? That is the reason why still oxygen is used as an oxidizer. So, issue is we use oxygen as oxidizer and methane is used as a diluent because the if you compare methane and nitrogen, nitrogen has a lower thermal conductivity as compared to methane. So, when you are uh, sending in air, so you have nitrogen as 79 percent. So, this 79 percent nitrogen will have limited capacity to conduct heat and then at the end again uh, you have to separate out nitrogen and why if you want to separate out nitrogen some ethene oxide or the ethene will also be separated. So, there will be loss of ethene. So, there will be loss of the raw material some raw material will also go with nitrogen. So, those reasons there is a catch why methane is used, but then you may always argue if methane is used no oxygen is used you will have CO2 formed then CO2 is used again there is a regeneration step. So, you again you add investment. So, we will see because there are trade offs you have ox air you have nitrogen in it nitrogen does not conduct heat. So, it will increase the cost while if you have oxygen you will have CO2 and if you have CO2 as diluent then you have to remove the CO2. So, there is a trade off which one to choose the trade off can only be answered with the cost. So, what is the cost of production? How much catalyst is required? And what is the way how easy it is to recycle the ethene oxide? Those will be determining the final process. So, we will see this is the final process. So, now the reactor is fed a mixture of ethene. I am assuming we start with oxygen rather than air. I will come back to that later why we choose oxygen and why not air for combustion. Reactor is fed with a mixture of ethene, oxygen, and inerts. What are these inerts? Inerts are reactant impurities, methane, and recycled carbon dioxide. All these are inerts that has been preheated. Considerable excess of ethene is utilized to maintain low, so more amount of ethene is utilized to maintain low conversion and strong selectivity toward ethene oxide. So, if you add more and more ethene oxide, so you should have lower conversion because oxygen is less. So, that is what it is. So, you have the ethene, the promoter, the methane, oxygen all entering together along with recycled CO2 which is coming from the CO2 regenerator that is these two are the CO2 regenerator. So, CO2 is also coming here. So, you have CO2 gas also coming here. Okay. So, this is that reactor. This is the reactor is a multitubular one. So, this boiling liquid is passed through this and the liquid if it is passed the heat is taken away from the waste heat boiler this heat is taken up the heat due to the heat of reaction the temperature conditions and pressure is. Now, the issue is we are taking a higher pressure 20 bar why because the higher pressure even though it is not much useful the case is in the second step we then this is the ethene oxide absorber at a high pressure it is the temperature is removed here, temperature is removed and it is helps in heating the feed and then sent to the ethene oxide absorber because water is present it becomes easier to separate out ethene oxide. Okay. So, we will see what does this absorber do in the next step. So, the gases leaving the reactor are cooled by heat exchange with the cooled with the heat exchange with the heat gas. So, this is the coolant cooling done by the heat exchange. Okay and delivered to a column where water is used to absorb ethene oxide which is only present at the concentration. The concentration of ethene oxide you can see it is just 1 to 2 mole percent. So, ethene oxide here, so you have water here let us say these are all entirely filled with water. So, you bubble this solution gases through this absorber separate out. So, what it goes in the bottom set the ethene oxide rich aqueous solution that exits the bottom of the ethene oxide absorber is passed through a stripping column and ethene oxide separated at the top. So, this is what it is passed through a stripping column and the remaining gases are sent of the top. So, it passes through a stripping column and sent to a desorber. What is this desorber does? So, because there will be some uh, reaction 
ethene oxide and water glycol may form. So, this glycol is in liquid phase and ethene oxide in gas phase. So, this is dissolver, dissolver means it dissolves the ethylene oxide, so ethene oxide from the top and the liquid from the bottom and some part of the liquid is sent back, is sent back to the absorber. So, if you see pressure has no effect on conversion ordinary reaction temperature, but the higher pressure helps in the absorption of the ethene oxide. So, this higher pressure eases in the absorption of ethene oxide by water. Ethene oxide absorber reduces the bottom stream and some ethylene glycol is generated when ethene oxide reacts with water. So, that is why I was telling the ethene oxide, this glycol is formed due to the reaction of ethene oxide with water. So, this goes to the ethene oxide dissolver. So, ethene oxide gases come on the top and some amount is taken out and some amount is again fed back to the ethene oxide absorber. We will go to the last step that is the purification column. Two columns of distillation, this is the purification column, separates ethene oxide from lightens. So, first is the lightens. So, this is the lightens column. So, lightens means carbon dioxide, acetaldehyde and other traces of hydrocarbons and residual water. To prevent the accumulation of inerts, a small portion of the gas exiting the atom of the ethene oxide absorber is passed. Now, just pay attention back to the absorber part. So, here I have separated out ethene oxide, the aqu aqueous solution of ethene oxide, okay, with because ethene oxide plus the aqueous solution is here. Issue is the remaining gases, these are off gases. What it will be? Off gases, these are off gases are carbon dioxide, acetaldehyde some traces of hydrocarbon. Now, the issue is what you do is you uh, separate a part, small portion of the gases what to do? You take out because you have to purge it because if you do not purge it, then you will have more and more inert and CO2 in, in the entire process, in the entire process you need to purge out. So, you are purging out some part here of the off gases and remaining or again compressing and sending to the CO2 regenerator. CO2 means here it will absorb CO2 with let us say with the help of some amines and here it will dissolve. So, you CO2 just throw outside, but obviously when you are throwing carbon dioxide outside it should be within the permissible limits otherwise you cannot throw. So, issue is you do not throw away all the gases, purge away some amount of gas, the remaining some gases you send back to the feed. So, this some gases which is sent back here and then again it is mixed with the feed concentration it is complete the entire separation. So, in the last column what you get is the ethene oxide water and ethene oxide gas in the top. So, this is again sent to the purification column further. So, to recover remaining which will be very less. So, after compression a portion of the recycling gas is diverted to an absorber where carbon dioxide it absorbed if you be recycled to the reactor. It helps maintain an adequate amount of carbon dioxide concentration. So, I was talking about this some amount of gas is sent carbon dioxide. Ethene and oxygen generate explosive combination at certain amounts. Feed to the reactor has to be around this mole percent ethene and around 7 mole percent oxygen. So, this is that formula which you have to maintain otherwise explosion may occur. So, the reaction method if it is above this then it will be above the top flammability limit and it will explode it is the upper flammability limit or upper upper flammability limit it may explode. So, that is the reason why we add inerts. The presence of carbon dioxide produced during combustion reduces the flammability limit hence all carbon dioxide is not removed from the recycling stream. So, another thing is why CO2 is again sent back it also uses as a inert as a diluent along with methane. So, it will reduce the overall composition of ethene oxide and oxygen. Depending on the amount of recycled inert methane can be supplied. So, uh, if you have, if you compute the amount of recycled inert it has, so methane can be supplied to lower the oxygen content. So, it may be supplied to lower the oxygen content. Instead of methane, uh, oxygen you can supply uh, methane and the flammability zone. So, methane serves two purpose. It can act as an oxygen source. I mean, it can also use in terms of oxygen or it can also used as a diluent, both ways it is added methane. So, now again we come back air or oxygen, preference is for air rather than oxygen, but nitrogen 
but air what happens nitrogen enters the recycle stream so you have 79 percent of nitrogen inserts the recycle stream now what to do with the 79 percent so resulting in major portion of the gas to be vented because you have to vent this nitrogen gas otherwise it will be in the system so there will be because you need to vent it out it means there will be substantial loss of unconverted ethene so this is the advantage improving the ethene conversion prior to venting a secondary or purge reactor is used so, if you want to improve the ethene conversion prior to venting, prior to venting, a secondary or purge reactor is required, which means that you need to separate out the nitrogen from oxygen. So, another reactor is required, so it improve the cost. But then if I want to discuss with oxygen, yes, we can always argue that it is counterbalanced by the requirement of a carbon dioxide removal mechanism. So, we saw the regenerator part of carbon dioxide. So, it is adding up in the cost. So, running costs of the two processes are distinct. In one case, you have need to account for the price of oxygen, or in the other case, oxygen also requires, if you use oxygen, it will require a substantial amount of steam in the carbon dioxide removal unit. So, you use, you have a good amount of price for oxygen gas generation and then you also require a lot of steam in the carbon dioxide removal. So, these are the two disadvantages. So, counter taking, uh, uh, looking at both these aspects, it was found from the economics that a higher production rate per unit volume of catalyst, this is the first, if I want to say first part and a B is a less expensive ethene recycling offers important advantage. So, what is the decisive factor, decisive advantage, it is the higher production rate. So, if you use oxygen basis, the production rate of ethene oxide is much more as compared to when you use air as a source of oxygen. And the second is the recyclability cost is lesser in the oxygen based process. So, these two are the decisive advantages why oxygen is used as a source for combustion. So, these are the comparison. So, you have the concentrations, the processes are oxygen based, air based. So, methane, ethene, uh, you can take uh, oxygen, it means you are taking more and more of feed, but in air based, in it, it cannot be more, it has to be around 2 to 10. Then uh, you will need oxygen to 5 to 9, 4 to 8. So, these are almost similar 5 to 15 of CO2 in air based, this much is generated. The inert is only ammonia and argon, inert gases mainly nitrogen, but in this case mainly nitrogen. Temperature of the reactor is similar, pressure is also similar, but this is higher pressure is required for air in the air process, bit higher pressure as compared to the oxygen based. The GHSV, what is GHSV? The gas hourly space velocity, what is this? The ratio of volume of gas present in the feed gas at STP per hour to volume of the reactor or catalyst. The ratio of the volume of the gas, how much of the gas is present in the feed gas? as compared to the reactor volume. The conversion is in air waste, the conversion is more. So, you need to have a you know the flammability part, you need to add more and more of air while in the case of selectivity is almost similar. So, per this is if you compare the conversion, the conversion even though it is more, but uh, in this uh, this 7 to 15 percent, but the other advantages as I call, told the cost of recycling or the cost of the production rate is much more in the oxygen based plant. This is 75 to 80 is the selectivity. The selectivity is higher in the case of oxygen based as compared to air. So, all these are the advantages of oxygen and air based processes. So, we now go on to the malic anhydride production. So, the malic anhydride production is very important, the malic anhydride, this is used in copolymerization and addition reaction to produce polyester, resins and plasticizer. So, this is a starting point for these products, polyester, resins, plasticizer. So, usually they are made using this schematic. So, you have butane, butene, 1, 3 butadiene. So, this is butene, this is butene. So, dibutene, so this is in, the, in general I write a dibutene, then this is furan and finally this is maliganhydride. Right? 
So you see from butane to malic anhydride there are number of intermediate steps, formation of butene, formation of dibutene, formation of furan. So it means all these reactions again gets have a chance of reacting with oxygen. So if they react with oxygen, they will again form carbon dioxide and water. So it means that there are chances that it should be highly selective and uh, what you do is you have to convert in such a manner that the exothermicity is minimized because if you see the overall reaction is with oxygen is around minus 1260 and if uh, in the order of this for ethene oxide is almost an order I think it is around 120 for ethene oxide. So this reaction is 10 times more exothermic so you need to remove the heat okay. So the removal of heat is a tricky process so because the issue is if this reaction is continued then all these products butene, dibutene and on this furan they will have incomplete or complete combustion to produce CO2 and H2O. So that we have to avoid. So if the catalyst should be selective and the reactor should be also uh, good enough so that it will only allow the selective oxidation of butene to malic anhydride. How do we do that? Let us see. So usually we saw that these are used for the, the copolymerization of an addition reaction to produce polyester resins and plasticizer. So this is the process which we will follow the selective oxidation of butene. The commercial procedures are catalytic and based on fluidized bed or multiple multitubular fixed bed reactor. As I told you these are important because fluidized bed the temperature heat control is easy multitubular reactors means through the tube you pass uh, hydrocarbon liquid high boiling liquid. So it will pass through a vapor spray and it will take out the heat. The intermediates as I told you like butene or dibutene or 1,3-butadiene they are more reactive than the starting material and the reactions are extremely exothermic. So it is if these reactions we allow it to form these are extremely reactive the intermediate. So this may lead to the formation of hot spot. So hot spot means there is non-uniform temperature and the non-uniform temperature means you get a lower and lower conversion and some other products are formed. So highly exothermic reaction makes substantially lower single reactor capacity. So you can achieve only 40,000 tons per annum because it is highly exothermic reaction for the synthesis of malic anhydride and fixed bed reactor. So what this so it means that you need to innovate. So in the case of innovation what you need to do it is similar to the selective oxidation of ethene to ethene oxide where the total or partial oxidation of N butane and malic anhydride produces byproducts that is CO2, H2 and CO. So same cases the intermediates form CO2, H2 and CO. So you need to avoid that. So it should be selective enough to oxidize butane to malic anhydride. How do we do that? So this is the way they do it. So fluidized bed reactor is taken as an alternative to fixed bed reactor. It will enable the improved temperature control and increased speed concentration. The catalyst attrition of this fluidized bed reactor is a significant issue. So earlier they were using fluidized bed reactor but the issue is the catalyst attrition. Now to improve this DuPont company, DuPont you might be knowing, DuPont. DuPont has devised a new configuration, a scheme which uses a riser and a fluidized bed reactor into um, together. So if you see the reactor feed is entering here, this is a riser reactor where the reaction takes place okay, with the catalyst. So when it takes place the catalyst, the catalyst is prepared in this manner. So conventionally what they do is they will uh, put this active material on the silica matrix. Okay. So it means only the surface area is in contact. So when the surface area is in contact, so only the reaction rate is very less. So what they did in this, they used this vanadium phosphorus oxide VPO, they call this VPO based catalyst. Uh, they are, uh, what they do is, it is like a shell, it's silica shell, this type of shells. Okay. So what it will do is the reactants can go inside this shell, react and again diffuse back. So the entire area, the surface is used for reaction. But then how is it different? Because this porous silica shell is only 5 to 10 percent now, earlier it was only 30 to 50 percent. So if you see the active ingredient is less 
as compared to porous silica shale because here only 5 to 10 percent is that silica shale, the remaining is the active ingredient which is the DuPont catalyst. This DuPont catalyst is then fed in here, okay. So, you have a catalyst regeneration unit, catalyst regenerator here. and this is the reactor. So, it is similar to styrene production, redox type reaction. So, what you do? Here you have oxidization happening, there is reduction happening. So, in the oxidation means here the oxygen is taken away from this vanadium phosphorus oxygen O and is sent and the reaction is occurring and the oxygen lean catalyst is sent and it is collected from the top. This is separated, the reduced catalyst is separated here and then the remaining gas, the production, that is the ethene oxide is taken away from here. The ethene oxide comes, sorry not ethene oxide, the malic anhydride is comes away from the top. The remaining ox catalyst which is oxygen lean because it has given away the oxygen into this riser reactor, it is then again combusted with air. It is again combusted with air and the catalyst is regenerated and sent back to the riser reactor. So, because it is an exothermic reaction, again you produce high pressure steam out of this reactor and we have some off gases which is sent and sent to the incinerator. So, this two goes on simultaneously. So, it means the oxygen demand in the riser reactor is balanced by the oxygen addition in the catalyst regenerator. So, these two, it is similar to like redox reaction. So, this is the way the DuPont has developed this silica this particular catalyst which are made of vanadium phosphorus oxide. So, the pore size is around 45 to 100 micrometer. So, this is the innovation we need to do for such processes. So, it is a riser and fluidized bed. So, another is important aspect is this riser, it almost behaves in a plug flow manner. So, there are no radial gradients. So, the heat control is better, there is no radial gradient, only the axial gradient will be there. So, axial gradient means the conversion is such a manner in a plug flow reactor. So, you can add the feed in several locations in different stages. That is also you have some degree of freedom. So, it is what uh, you need to focus or you need to devise a strategy to overcome such reaction limiting steps. So, this new invention is a riser reactor which is actually developed together with Monsanto and DuPont. DuPont developed the catalyst, the Monsanto and then they de devised the flow scheme. The active material that is the active material is the VPO, the vanadium phosphorus oxide. It is encapsulated, mean it is coated on the porous silica shell. Pore openings of the shell should permit unhindered division of the reactants and products without affecting conversion or selectivity. This is important. So, you make these shells where the reactants can go, react and then come out. So, the mass transfer limitation is very less. That is the prior objective. The oxidized catalyst transfers oxygen to butane. So, oxygen is transferred from the catalyst to butane and butane gets converted to form malic anhydride. And then you have the cyclone at the top of the riser reactor. The catalyst is separated because it is solid from the product that is malic anhydride. Then the catalyst subsequently is reoxidized in a standard fluidized bed reactor. So, what are the advantages of this catalyst regenerator which is a fluidized bed reactor? The oxidation is accomplished without molecular oxygen. Reaction mixture is never within the explosion limits. You do not have to take care because you are sending air not oxygen. The residence duration you can control in both the reactor and regenerator. In such a manner, it is independent allowing optimal conditions to be established for both reactors. When I mean optimal condition, it means the oxygen losing the way amount of oxygen which is lost in the riser reactor it needs to be exactly balanced by the oxygen which is getting added up in the regenerator. So, these two rates should go hand in hand. So, that is why you can maneuver both these reactors independently. It does not, one of them does not depend on the function of the other. So, that is another advantage. That is why nowadays this production of malic anhydride is used and it is usually processed to the Monsanto DuPont scheme. So, I will stop my uh, lecture here, I will conclude here.
please go through this Jacob Mullins textbook where you will find out the more about the process that is of the ethene oxide process and the malic anhydride process and go to this DuPont paper. DuPont's that is the circulating fluidized bed CFB they call this entire process as circulating fluidized bed reactor technology for malic anhydride. Please go through this you will come to know about the process condition and the process parameter how they optimize in actual experimental setup. Thank you. Thank you.